Biological information. Information theory. We are currently talking about the book Biological Information. Its full title is Biological Information, New Perspectives. It was uh, edited by Robert Marx, Michael Behe, William Dembski, Bruce Gordon, and John Sanford. Most of you, well, some of you will know John Sanford. Some of you will know, at least recognize the other names. It was published by World Scientific Publishing. You may remember that, that it was supposed to be published by Springer, but they uh, backed out of it um, at the last minute after howls of protest from the evolution lobby. Um, it was published in 2013. It was the proceedings of a symposium held at Cornell University, not approved by Cornell, um, but um, they did rent the rooms there. And um, the uh, proceeding, uh, the papers can be found on the internet. And so uh, if you want to read them, those of you who get the email, uh, the, the link is also there. And you can just click it from there. Um, there are, uh, the book itself looks something like that. Uh, it's divided into several sections. There's the general introduction, which we went through yes, uh, last Sabbath. There's the biological information and genetic theory, which is where we are going to start. There's multiple papers in that section. Theoretical mo molecular biology and biological information and self-organizational complexity theory. Um, and some of the papers are, are not theistic. But they all are saying that the current neo-Darwinian synthesis is faulty, uh, cannot explain what it needs to, and uh, needs to be at least supplemented, if not superseded. So the paper that we're going to be talking about is t entitled Biological Information, What Is It? And the abs it's written by Werner Gitt and um, also, Robert Compton and Jorge Fernandez helped out. Werner Gitt is uh, former head of information technology director and professor of the uh, German Federal Institute of Physics and Technology. So pretty reasonably prestigious uh, position. Um, Robert Compton is uh, in the Department of Veterinary Anatomy and uh, of um, Washington State University, and uh, uh, Jorge Fernandez uh, looks like he has his own company. Um, the abstracts, uh, which kind of outlines where they're going, uh, scientific dis discoveries, especially over the last six decades, have left no doubt that information plays a central role in biology. Specialists have thus thought to study the information in biological systems using the same definitions of information as have been traditionally used in engineering, computer science, mathematics, and in other disciplines. Unfortunately, all of these traditional de definitions lack aspects that even non-specialists recognize as being essential attributes of information, qualities such as meaning and purpose. To remedy that deficiency, we define another type of information, universal information, that more accurately embodies the full measure of information. Uh, we then examine the DNA and RNA and protein synthesizing system with this uh, definition of universal information and conclude that universal information is indeed present and that it is essential for all biological life. Furthermore, other types of information such as mental imaging information also play a key role in life. It thus seems inevitable that the biological sciences and science in general must consider other than traditional definitions of information if we were to answer some of the fundamental questions about life. And uh, they're going to propose a new definition of information which they will call universal information. Uh, the title of this symposium is Biological Information New Perspectives. But what do we mean by the term biological information? We suggest that at present it cannot be unambiguously defined. Yet an unambiguous definition would be extremely helpful because multiple levels of communication systems are being researched. 
from the DNA coded information in the genome to the intracellular communications network involving RNA and proteins to intercellular signaling via entities such as hormones, all the way up to and including the nervous system and the brain. Clearly, identifying all of these communication systems and identifying the information that is being transferred will be a challenge. It is clear that there are many subsets or categories of biological information and that many more will be discovered. At some point, perhaps after further research, we will be in a position to more precisely define biological information. For the interim, we will offer a description of it as a placeholder until we have enough knowledge to define it with scientific rigor. Um, we propose that biological information includes all manifestations of information in living organisms. This description has the potential to include all categories of information. From recent scientific studies in genetics, it is clear that there are many subsets of biological information, that is codes, and many more wait to be d uncovered within the DNA RNA systems alone. It is reasonable to believe that progress on biological information will be accelerated if each subset is unambiguously defined. Towards this goal, we should begin by defining a definition. A description or explanation of a word or thing by its attributes, properties, or relations that distinguishes it from all other entities. That's what they mean by definition. Even applying this definition caref carefully is important because scientifically rigorous results cannot be achieved when using ambiguous terms. A common example of this is the claim that evolution is a fact. The validity of such a claim is certainly going to depend on the precise meaning of the term evolution. Defining subsets of information. This leads to ask the more general question, what precisely is information? Anyone who studied this field is aware of three working definitions of information. One, classical information theory. Shannon, or statistical information, dealing solely with the technical engineering aspects of communication. This involves analysis including obtaining statistics on the material symbols for data transmission, storage, and processing. Two, algorithmic information theory. Solomonov, or Kolmogorov, Chaitin information, dealing with the complexity, as this term is defined in the theory, of material symbols and data structures and of objects in general. Complex specified information, CSI theory. Dembski, roughly the same as classical information theory, but adding the important concept of a specification. It's got to fit into some relatively narrow subset of all the possible answers that one could get for the same uh, uh, for the same length of message. These theories, like modern genetics, focus primarily on the material carriers of the information. On the other hand, American mathematician and National Medal of Science recipient Narble uh, Wiener, pardon me, yeah, that's Wiener, in 1968, made his often quoted statement, information is information, neither matter nor energy. Wiener's statement prompted one of us, get, to ask if information is not matter, mass and energy, well, then what is it? Get therefore started a long quest to define information, at least the information that was most familiar to scientists of that day. Remember, this is actually his job. As an information scientist, Git not only examined the information conveyed within human natural languages, but also the information conveyed within abstract and artificial languages, such as machine language. In his studies, he identified five attributes, four of which qualified as distinguishing attributes of information. Before we examine these, let us make it clear that these natural and artificial language systems were first studied because at that time they'd always been ex already been extensively characterized. We use these human information systems as known systems which would most, most likely be amenable to precise definition. You work with what you know. 
Examples of this are abundant. For example, the first five words of the Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, four score and seven years ago, may be inscribed on paper and ink, or chiseled onto a block of granite, or on a blackboard with chalk, or in the air with smoke signals, with the vibrations of speech, or on a transmission line with electrical dots and dashes as in Morse code, or a computer's hard drive by properly selecting magnetic bits, or in many other ways all of them having the same information. With this, we see that the actual information is completely independent of the material medium that serves only to carry it. Any one of a multitude of material media and formats may be used to carry exactly the same information. While there is indeed a correlation between the material media and format that carries the information, the dictum, correlation does not imply causation, certainly applies here. The material car carrier cannot be and is not the cause of the information. N now, I just tell you, I'm not going to read you the whole thing. Uh, so where you see yellow ellipses, anything in yellow, that's what I have said, not what Git has said. There's also a set of rules governing what is permissible regarding the arrangements of the symbols the syntax. With a combination of abstract code and syntax, we are able to generate more complex language structures such as words and sentences. However, at this formal language stage, meaning plays no role. It was at this level only that Shannon developed his theory of communication into the highly useful statistical analysis of the material symbols solely for the technical purpose of data transmission, storage, and processing. Code plus syntax is a necessary distinguishing attribute of all human languages. In order to develop, learn from, or use a code plus syntax, it requires a high degree of, me internal, of mental effort and intelligence. Not only, no one at any one time has ever observed this basic attribute of information, that is code plus syntax, being established through unguided, purely physiochemical processes. However, we have observed young children learning the alphabet and learning to read, write, and speak words. However, this does not in any way explain how the first humans acquired this ability. If we assume this happened without intelligent guidance, there are only two alternatives. One, it is an inherent property of matter. Or two, it is possible for these abilities to evolve over time. A person may choose to believe in either of these alternatives, but that person would have to also accept that this is a belief with no hard science to support it. Meaning. So we've talked about code and syntax, now we're at meaning, this is number two. The next level of this, it's distinguishing attributes of information in human languages is meaning. At this level, words are assigned to represent something. Additionally, that something must be defined, and that definition is also re represented by words. For example, the word cat, which he has a note on. And he finishes that by saying, thus a measure of circularity is ultimately avoidable. That is to say, if you're using language solely. Um, most people define cat because they have seen cats of various kinds. And so really it's with reference to the animal and not with reference to the words that we put behind it. Higher levels of meaning and information content are constructed using phrases, sentences, and paragraphs. In our example of a cat, which is footnote one, its definition is a sentence that represents a creature and the word cat. Meaning is an absolutely essential attribute of information that is conveyed in language and communication. Well, almost absolutely essential. <laughs> there are a few people who speak without any meaning, but whatever. Uh, words written and spoken can be used to represent entities, events, and or concepts, literally anything. The entities need not be present. The words that evoke them, if you say, if I say a cat, you know what I'm talking about, even though there are no cats in this room. Um, unguided, purely physiochemical processes have never been observed cre creating this substitutionary process. 
We are referring here to natural, unguided, purely physiochemical processes that have no external guiding control systems found in information-rich systems. These seem to eliminate all biological information systems as being examples of unguided, purely physiochemical processes. And of course, that last sentence is fighting words. Um, and uh, will be met with the appropriate skepticism from people who do not wish to believe that there is information beyond matter and energy. Expected action. The examination of sentences or paragraphs in a message implies an Im reveals an implied request or command for the receiver of the message to perform some action. These actions start with the receiver reading and understanding the message. This in itself involves very complex actions. From understanding the message, the receiver must decide whether or not he or she will comply fully, partially, or not at all with the sender's expected action. If the decision is to fully comply, then the receiver performs whatever action was indicated or purposed by the sender's message. Here we must distinguish between two types of receivers, an intelligent being and a machine. In the former, the intelligent being can respond to the request or command in highly variable ways. With the machine, the meaning has been programmed into, signal, into command signals that start or initiate the action level. The system's control program guides the machine is to automatically perform the action. In both cases, machines are essential for performing the expected actions. In the case of the intelligent being, the machinery of his body may be sufficient or he may need to use, utilize external machinery, which may be mechanical or electrical machines, animals or other humans, etc. Intended purpose. Prior to issuing a, an original written or verbal message, there must be an internal thought process that motivates the sender to formulate a message. Otherwise, it wouldn't do it. This thought process is necessarily complex and involves need, motivation, or intent for something to be achieved. If it is not to be performed by the sender, in which case why send, then the thought process must include selecting a particular receiver or receivers and determining whether or not that receiver is capable of performing the expected action. Information's attribute of intended purpose is essential at the very beginning of a message. The achievement of that purpose is the result of the receiver's performance of the desired action. The most important attribute of information is the intended purpose, and it is, and that is, it is at both ends of a successfully completed message. I want you to pass the microphone, and you hear me, and you do it. That you can pass it back. <laughs> That's it. That's just an example of, of, of the kind of thing that can happen with sending and receiving messages. And that one was done verbally. I could just as easily, well, not just as easily, but I could instead have passed a note. Um, I could have, uh, if, uh, I could have texted on, on uh, on uh, email or, or, or uh, text messaging, if you had a receiver for doing that. Any one of those would have worked and they would have done the same thing. The definition of universal information. All four attributes described above are necessary to unambiguously distinguish this subject category of information, or this subset or category of information. Due to this, the formal definition of universal information stated below incorporates all four attributes. A symbolically encoded, abstractly represented message conveying the expected action and the intended purpose. Sometimes not conveying the intended purpose, but sometimes you can figure out what the purpose was. Now, we can appraise the three previously discussed working definitions of information in the light of the attributes of universal information. 
Shannon's classical information theory concerns itself only with statistical relationships of material symbols found within the code of universal information. This was because nothing more was necessary in order to address the technical issues of information transmission and storage. But notice it doesn't deal with the content of the information at all. Well, Shannon stated this point clearly in his landmark paper. So Shannon information is not the whole story. Most modern-day evolutionary theorists champion his definition primarily because it allows for the creation of information by randomly assembling symbols. This makes creation of biological information trivial and separates biological information from biological functionality. Uh, as long as you've got DNA there, it doesn't matter what it, uh, what it codes for, which is, if you think about it, for a very short time, ridiculous. The attempt to define biological information in this way is very clearly ideologically driven and is obviously not sufficient, since no thinking person would exclude meaning and purpose from biological or functional information. Algorithmic information is a measure of the information content of material systems in terms of the degree of complexity, as algorithmic complexity is defined, of the system. Those material systems displaying greater complexity, more aperiodicity, have higher information content than those material systems displaying less complexity or more periodicity. The four distinguishing attributes of universal information are not required for algorithmic information. So algorithmic information is not the same as universal information and it is missing something important. Complex specified information exists in all material systems that exhibit a specification. And this specification is expressed in terms of functionality or purpose. As a result, CSI requires only UI's distinguishing attribute of purpose. By definition, this means that any system exhibiting CSI implies design. Even though all of the distinguishing attributes of UI were necessary during the design and construction phase, phase these attributes need not be present in the observed complex specified system. The nature of universal information. Having clearly distinguished universal information from other types our def definitions of information, we now proceed to answer, at least for universal information, the question, if information is not mass and energy, what is it? In the following discussion, we will use the term matter to include both mass and energy, and the term non-material entity to refer to all enter entities outside the material domain. Those that are partly outside, I think, would also be included as at least partly non-material. There are many significant criteria for distinguishing material entities from non-material entities. Perhaps the most simple direct and scientific criterion is the fact that all material entities can be measured and therefore, thereby quantified using one or a combination of the seven units of measurement established by the System Internationale. These are the meter, kilogram, ampere, kelvin, mole, candela, and second. Any entity within the universe that cannot be measured and described with one or combination of these units is, by definition, a non-material entity. Another criterion is that a non-material entity does not and cannot originate from unguided purely physiochemical processes. You can't get non-matter from matter. Finally, a non-material entity does not have any direct physiochemical interaction with matter. Universal information satisfies all of the above criteria for non-material entity. A material medium is essential for the storage, transmission, and processing of UI, but, as described earlier, the quantity and type of matter that is used is highly variable and not correlated at all to the value of the universal information. That is, the universal information is completely independent of the material medium. Additionally, the codes, the symbols, code level, that are utilized and physically manifested in the material domain display a vast degree of variation. To illustrate this, figure one depicts the words from ten different languages that have the same meaning 
even though the individual symbols or letters differed markedly from one another. However, regardless of the symbols used, the content of the meaning remains essentially the same. Content as used here includes the attributes of meaning, action, and purpose. And uh, there they are, Georgians at the top, Arabic, Russian, Lithuanian, I believe, skipping a couple of German, and then Braille, Morse code, shorthand, and standard English, all of which, of course, are related to English. And, of course, there's probably Russian shorthand and so forth as well. Does biological life contain universal information? There have been monumental advances in both information and science theory and genetics and molecular biology in the last six decades. The processes involved in cellular synthesis of proteins have been explained in great detail. We will examine this DNA, RNA, protein synthesizing system to determine if it stores and conveys universal information. In order to systematically make this determination, we will look for each distinguishing attribute of universal information in the cell's protein synthesizing system. Code plus syntax, yep. Within DNA, RNA, we have a four-letter alphabet, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. In RNA, the thymine is replaced by uracil. These four letters are arranged into words that are always composed of three letters. These three-letter words are called codons. So we have a code, four-letter alphabet, and syntax, three-letter words. Thus, the first distinguishing attribute of u universal information is present, code plus syntax. Abstract meaning. There are four to the third or 64 different three-letter words that may be composed out of the four letters in the code. Apart from three stop codons, each of the remaining 61 three-letter words or codons means or represents or demotes, denotes one of the 20 amino acids utilized in polypeptide or protein synthesis. The code for methionine also denotes or represents a start command. Despite intensive research, no physiochemical bonding relationship has been found between the codons and the amino acids they represent that has to be mediated by transfer RNA. Uh, hence, the second distinguishing attribute of universal information is present, abstract meaning. The code means the amino acid but doesn't actually physically look like it or look like something that it fits into or anything like that. The expected action. The messenger RNA or mRNA is transported out of the cell nucleus into the cytosol to a very complex RNA or protein machine, the ribosome, RNA and protein machine. At the ribosome, beginning with a start codon on the mRNA, this specific RNA codon is joined with an anticodon at one end of the small transfer RNA molecule. At the other end of the tRNA is the amino acid specified by the mRNA codon, in this case methionine. The mRNA th is then advanced one codon step and another tRNA anticodon is joined to the mRNA codon. At this stage, two amino acids have been brought together and the ribosome, utilizing energy, joins the two amino acids together by forming a peptide bond. This process repeats itself until a stop codon is reached on the mRNA. This precise synthesis of a unique functional protein by the ribosome or this machine, fulfills the third distinguishing attribute of universal information, an expected action. It's going to make an enzyme or a structural protein or something. However, this is only the first level of action. At a macroscopic level, the activity of proteins in muscles of higher animal perform useful work. DNA replication requires protein nanomachines of different kinds and uh, usable energy. Next, transcription to mRNA requires a DNA template, several other nanomachines, and 
usable energy. Finally, it's synthesis of all protein nanomachines and protein structural elements require mRNA, tRNA, and more nanomachines, and useful energy. This essentially closed loop conundrum has stymied researchers for decades as they have tried, attempted to account for the origin of the first living cell through unguided, purely physicochemical processes. Their attempt at protein first, DNA first, or RNA first models have all failed. This is the old problem which came first, the chicken or the egg. It's pretty hard to have one without the other. And in fact, you have to have both of them at the same time to begin with which is worse than the chicken and the egg. The intended purpose, the universal information instructions for protein synthesis are stored within the nuclear DNA. The initial purposes of these UI instructions are achieved as the process of transcription and translation are successfully accomplished. The ultimate physical purpose for the DNA RNA protein synthesizing system is for the initial creation of organisms and for their operations, maintenance, and reproduction. The multiple purposes achieved by the DNA RNA protein synthesizing system attach to the fact that the fourth distinguishing attribute of universal intelligence intended purpose is indeed present. It's very hard for, for biologists to discuss living organisms without using words that sound like purpose. The acorn woodpecker pecks a hole in the tree in order to put a, an acorn into it, in order to store it for the winter so that it will survive. Universal information senders, transmitters, and receivers. Problems associated with re determining the origin and utilization of universal information can be somewhat mitigated if we use specific terms to differentiate between the following. One, an original sender is an intelligent agent that creates the original UI message. As demonstrated by their book, this intelligent agent must have a non-material component beyond the embedded universal information. This is because even UI-guided purely physical chemical processes wholly constrained by natural laws have never been observed to create de novo universal information. So presumably they can't do it. Since humans do create de novo universal information, they qualify as original senders. This is strong evidence that humans have a non-material component beyond their embedded universal information. That is, beyond the DNA, RNA, protein system, and all of the cell wall components that have coded information on them and so forth. Intermediate transmitters Receive a UA message and simply copy, transmit, display, or broadcast the message. Ideally, an intermediate transmitter will not distort the meaning of the original message in any way, although they can, of course. Intermediate transmitters can be intelligent agents, I tell you, you tell somebody else, or they can be machines that are specifically designed to perform the transmitting process. We are recording this. We will be sending it out on the internet. That is a transmitting, receiving, intermittent, intermediate transmitter. But without me talking at the beginning, nothing gets on the internet that's of any worth. And in fact, I am actually transmitting to you what Werner Gitt had to say. So in that sense, he's the original transmitter and I am technically an intermediate transmitter. Machine receivers obtain and process the messages and perform the commanded action, thereby achieving this purpose, the purpose intended by the original sender. Machine receivers, either mechanical or biological, do not have the capacity to freely interpret the messages. They must be pre-programmed with the capacity to receive, then process, then execute the commands without requiring that the meaning of the message be determined. This is like robots that are putting together cars. They're told, move here, grab this, lift it, put it on the car, and they have no thought processes, which is actually very convenient for a, an autob automobile manufacturer because they never think, I should be getting paid for doing this, and I think I'll strike for higher wages. 
Intelligent receivers possess the capacity, capability of determining the meaning of the message and also possess the capability of making free choices. This latter capability allows the intelligent receiver to decide whether to perform the expected action fully, partially, or not at all. Workers can actually go on strike. When the UI in the DNA RNA protein synthesizing system is expressed in biological life, it guides the transcription or trans and translation process to produce a specified protein. This protein will then perform a specific functions within the cell or within the organism. This is an example of number three above, whereby machines are guided by instructions, namely universal information, that was stored in the nuclear DNA of the cell by the original sender of that universal information. The existence, validity, and significance of universal information. While identifying and studying the distinguishing attributes of universal information, we discovered and formulated 32 empirical statements involving the origin and nature of universal information. For that, you'll have to read their book. We have repeatedly verified these empirical statements over a 30-year period. Not one of these empirical statements has ever been refuted despite wide dissemination of this information, and they remain an open challenge to this day. We then turned our attention to the code discovered in the DNA and the volumes of research describing it. Universal information is definitely stored, transmitted, and util utilized within the DNA RNA protein synthesizing system of all living organisms. In other words, UA is not merely an interesting theoretical concept. UI truly exists. UI is a vital control system found in all biological life on Earth. Undoubtedly, the most important activity in science is to utilize factual data and observations to construct reliable and valid conclusions. According to Kreeft, there are three things that must be in place in order to develop logically sound arguments. The significant terms must be unambiguous, the premises must be true, and the conclusion must logically follow from the premises. That is, the argument must be logically valid. In order to satisfy these three requirements, we carefully defined all significant terms so that there would be clear, unambiguous formulations of the questions, arguments, and conclusions. With this foundation, we then proposed specific empirical statements as scientific laws and used them along with verified scientific facts as premises in our deductions. Finally, we constructed 10 logically sound deductions that led to strong, uh, 10 strong conclusions. Again, this is all in the, in the book. By rigorously following this procedure, we have minimized investigator bias uh, or, or inference from our conclusions or interference, I'm sorry, from, for, from our conclusions. This is important for any conclusion in science, but especially so in this case because of the broad significance of these 10 conclusions. Also by minimizing investor, investigator interference, these results obtain, retain objective, objective validity to the extent that this is possible. Conclusion, coming full circle, we return to our original question regarding biological information. What is it? We have identified an important subset of biological information that we call universal information that is present in every cell of every living organism. We, the authors of this paper, used universal information in order to communicate these things to you. This universal information was processed through our brains that in turn controlled our body parts to write words on this page. These words reach receptors in your visual system or in this case also auditory system, that will then send impulses, that is messages, to your brain. You then determine the meaning of the words of our message and consider their significance. This too is universal information and is also because both you and the writers of the paper are biological organisms, part of biological information. Between our intracellular DNA, RNA systems, and our capacity to express thoughts through words, there are many levels, going up from cell to organ to so forth, of highly integrated, organized biological systems which themselves necessarily operate under the control of some kind, type of biological information. Will we find biological information in forms other than universal information? We believe that we will. For instance, 
material image information is information in which there's meanings, action, and purpose, but no abstract code, syntax, or abstract meaning. We, we know that uh, MII plays a role in living organisms, yet MII does not have an abstract role, uh, abstract code, syntax, or meaning. For example, a spoon and a fork and a highway sign directly, that is not abstractly, um, represents food or eating place since it resembles the entity that it represents. Another example is pheromones. The pheromone molecule is not an abstract substitute for the entity, it is the entity itself. Just as was the case for complex specified information in intelligent design theory, universal information in related topics represent a revolutionary departure from the materialistic approach to information. Since UI and its requisite machines have, a great, have great explanatory power in biology, a search for machines, even without explicit uh, or embedded universal information operating at various ranges of scale in the inanimate world, may also yield results with great explanatory power. Now, that's the end of their book. And now I'm going to give you a very short take, and then we'll open this up to discussion. This seems to me like a more sophisticated concept of information than any of the previous, and I think it captures the, the point um, that mo most of the time the purpose of information is, uh, is to communicate some kind of an idea that has an impact. And if you can't get that part into it, then things like Shannon information and Kolmogorov information are uh, not that helpful. They're helpful in some ways in defining how much you have to do to, to communicate that information, but they have no, no bearing on what difference the information makes. One can make good arguments from it that purely material uh, processes are inadequate to ex explain life. However, materialists are unlikely to accept these arguments if they have previously rejected uh, complex specified information and its various variants like functional complex specified information. The problem, frankly, is not informational, it is volitional. They don't want to believe, therefore the evidence really doesn't matter. How to approach that problem is a difficult subject and I'm not sure that this paper will do the job it will be helpful for people trying to understand. It will not be helpful for people trying not to understand. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Well, I'll just uh, raise one concept that uh, comes into the picture here to a certain extent in this information thing, and that is the phenomenon of, of consciousness, a feeling that we exist. Uh, it is often stated as something beyond the mechanistic. It is also often stated as just a complex combination of the mechanistic. In other words, if computers get complex enough, they're going to have a feeling that they exist. Now, this is all, you know. Uh, of, of course, we don't have speaking. computers that, that actually do that as far as we know. As far as we know, they don't yet. Uh, but um, I don't know that complexity is the answer uh, to universal information. I don't know that it is not. Uh, it is used. It is used as an explanation, I think. Uh, and I, I, um, I wish we had a clear, a clear. Uh, a statement here that 
would define those two, separate those two, that is complexity versus universal information as they use it here? Um, well, he is making a separation between sheer complexity, um, the inability to compress information or um, the number of different uh, possibilities that are involved don't really tell you what the information is that you're, that you're discussing. Uh, uh, we can take an example from right here. The reason why most of us are here is because, one, it's happened before. Some of us are here because this is a subject that we're interested in and we heard or we got an email, various ways of finding that out, and so we decided this is where we want to be. Um, and it really had very little to do with, let's say, whether we had pizza last night or not. And I think that this is one of the points that is being made. There is such a thing as purpose. In a universe with ultimate purposelessness, it's difficult to understand why anybody would want to, do, to come here to listen. Uh, why anybody would want to do anything like that. Um, you know, um, to say, for example, that we even have a drive to reproduce doesn't tell us um, why we should. Um, this deliberate cutting off of purpose, I think eventually, it, it's too obvious that organisms have purposes. One of them is, in fact, to reproduce. One of them is to live. In the case of humans, though, we do a whole lot more than just live and reproduce. And to try to redu reduce that too, or we just want to live and we just want to reproduce, doesn't make a lot of sense. It particularly doesn't make sense in terms of how you account for altruism, where people's purpose seems to be to have somebody else survive. Sometimes somebody who can't reproduce. <coughs> From, uh, to try to reduce everything to that minimal purpose doesn't seem to make much sense. And yet, if you think about it, even that minimal purpose is at least a purpose. And what that means is that you can't get there from sheer material. The material has to be organized in such a way that it exhibits at least the outward appearance of wanting to do something. Just, just commenting on that, I would uh, say it is probably uh, restrictive to try and use that approach. Uh, unless you have a good reason for demonstrating that you've got to restrict everything to uh, simple information. I can recall my uh, professor of uh, uh, vertebrate animal behavior telling the class, you should not say that a bird sings joyfully you don't know that it's singing joyfully. Well, of course, my thinking was, yeah, how do you know that it isn't joyful? Uh, restriction is not a criterion of truth. If you have a, a dog or a cat that comes around and tries <coughs> to get petted, 
it's really hard not to say that they don't enjoy it. Or it's hard to say that they don't enjoy it. It's the the I understand a caution because sometimes thing uh, animals will do stuff that we we anthropomorphize too much. But I think that the dogmatic assertion that no anthropomorphism is even remotely plausible, I think is also a problem. Those critters sure look like they're enjoying what they're doing. Go ahead and then uh, we have a comment. Uh, you have a comment too? Okay. In the DNA in every cell of the body, as I understand it, is the uh, design of the entire being. Is that now right? Uh, a part of the design for uh, the entire being. There's some of the design is in the cell set of st structure itself as well. But uh, the major portion, I think, is probably fair to say. Yes. This, this now in itself tells us its information uh, that uh, gives a higher purpose for the entire being rather than just something pertaining to that one individual cell. So this, this tells us of a, a greater purpose. Is that not right? I think you can make that case. Um, people who try to define the religion often um, will say that religion the, or the practice of religion brings meaning and purpose into a person's life or gives meaning and purpose to a person. Atheists raise their hair on that because they will say that they have meaning and purpose as well. But what I'm hearing is that on a basic biological level, the DNA and the codons support the fact that there's even meaning on that small little level. And so it really moves back from a religion atheist argument to intelligent design an atheistic arg I mean an uh, evolutionary argument um, and meaning and purpose appear to what I'm hearing is that meaning and purpose appear to give evidence for master design I think they do yeah I, I was gonna mention too on that same kind of note I have another comment but uh, they did start a an atheist church in England, uh, I heard, but they don't call it a church, of course. They call it a gathering, well, tit for tat, whatever. Um, well, <laughs> ecclesia, those who are called out, okay, before that we had uh, synagogue, which is uh, uh, to go together. So if, you, if you've got a gathering, you've got a synagogue at least. It's the same thing. They, anyway. they meet on Sunday morning. <laughs> they meet on Sunday morning, which is interesting. Yes. Anyway, uh, so so far this, uh, this lecture has been a, a great one for uh, proving or showing the uh, basically the darkness of mankind right now. As much as, in spite of as much as we do know, uh, it shows really pretty clearly uh, so far uh, how much we don't know. I think it's much of it. Much of what we do know isn't conclusive, <laughs> seemingly. Uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. You say about not about any of these lectures, particularly if you miss them, um, or even if you miss them. Um, I had one explanation for uh, which came first, chicken and the egg. That uh, the egg doesn't incubate the chicken. Of course, there's some other ways of arguing with that. But uh, that strikes me that the total being was created uh, yeah. first. 
but I don't think this explains it all. I, I was thinking the same thing as, as he was, it uh, didn't explain consciousness. And I think it's a, an improvement for going in the right direction, but we're an awful long ways away yet. And I think we'll never have the answers. We have a comment uh, back here, and I think we'll let this one be the last one for officially, and then uh, for those of you who want to discuss it afterwards are welcome to come down. We'll have an informal discussion. As to language, God did a good job of interfering with information technology at the Tower of Babel. However, some languages that we speak, we can find similarities in words that sound about the same and probably mean the same. In language school, they told of a pastor and before a congregation in Latin America who was late and said that he was very embarazado, very embarrassed. Unfortunately, embarazado apparently means pregnant. Yes. Yes, it does. <laughs> you have to be careful about those cognates. Sometimes they'll fool you. Well, with that, uh, we'll invite you to come back next week, and um, uh, we'll be trying to simplify a bunch of really complicated mathematics um, by William Dembski and friends. The link to your presentation is on the uh, Yes, it is, actually.